lift off. Good evening, all the Tua around the world. Happy spring equinox here in the Northern Hemisphere. If you happen to be watching in the Southern Hemisphere, tough. <laughs> Apologies. Happy fall or autumn equinox to you. The day today upon which allegedly the length of night is the same as the length of day. I've never measured them, so I can't tell you whether that's true or not. I know that the sun is rising in the east and setting in the west. And I know that today, officially, according to the astronomers, is the day upon which the sun crosses the celestial equator. Something probably not known to prehistoric man or woman. And uh, from here on in, until September, until the autumn equinox, the day is longer than the night, or it will be longer than the night. Hopefully we'll get the weather to go along with it. It's been quite damp. And uh, speaking of damp, uh, I hope you all had a very good St. Patrick's Day. We had a reasonably good St. Patrick's Day, except for it rained on our parade. Quite literally, it rained on the St. Patrick's Day parade in Drogheda. For the first time in, I can't remember how long it is since there was rain on the morning or the the Drogheda parade is at 12 noon. Uh, I cannot remember. I just can't remember it raining on the parade. So it's been a long, long time. And it's raining again here this evening in the Boyne Valley. But you're not troubled by that, nor am I, hopefully, because for the next hour to an hour and a half, we are going to take our usual dive into Irish mythology. We are going back to the work of Charles Squire tonight and reading uh, another chapter, at least, hopefully, of his book about uh, Celtic myths and legends. Uh, and more of that shortly um, after I say hello to everybody, tell a couple of jokes, maybe, and show you all, show off some new books. I want to quickly say hello to Elaine Dent Lingenfelder, who was the first in the house tonight, uh, not an hour early like she was last week, but Anne McCallum was an hour early. Um, 12 Celsius. Oh, well, it was 13 here in Ireland today. I don't know what it is. Right? Actually, do you know what? I can find out very quickly what the temperature is uh, uh, in this area. Right now, it is 11 Celsius. Wow. You're only one degree warmer. Uh so, yes, Irish weather is absolutely right, Elaine, but a very good afternoon to you. Brendan Byrne is watching from, I think, Glendalough in County Wicklow. Good evening to you, Brendan. Hope you're well. Wayne Bird, <coughs> who is, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, uh, one of the Mythical Ireland patrons over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Please consider becoming. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's like, can we do that again? Yeah, take two. Please consider subscribing at patreon.com forward slash mythical Ireland. You'll see that address scrolling across the bottom of the screen. And Wayne, happy equinox to you too. Greetings of this uh, balance, time of balance. Uh, Patricia Pack is in the house. Happy spring to you also, Patricia. Dennis Dwyer is saying good evening to you all. Uh, Trinonawa, Dennis, and uh, Taris Jock. Falja is Jock. Joe Butler is saying happy spring equinox or joyous fall equinox, depending on where you are, from Colorado, shared to Mythical Ireland community and the Mythical Ireland creatives. Brilliant stuff, Joe. Thank you very much. Auntie Joe working hard behind the scenes. Mariana Dunn is saying happy spring equinox. Mariana, I did get your email and I did reply. Uh, just I didn't get a confirmation of that. So just in case you're wondering, I did reply to your email. So just maybe look in your inbox for that. Happy spring equinox from sunny and spring-like Virginia, close to where the cherry blossoms are blooming across the Potomac River. I don't know if this is early, but all of our uh, gorse or our furs, whins, is in bloom. And also, yeah, I've seen lots of apple blossom and a bit of cherry blossom in bloom as well. I thought that was April, but maybe I could be mistaken about that, and I probably am, to be honest. And Miriam Magau is saying happy spring equinox from France. Bonsoir. Uh, mon ami, uh, Miriam, you're very welcome. In Ireland, it means that it is it is as wet during the day as it is at night. That's Brendan's definition of the equinox, and I think he's absolutely 100% correct. Sue Prender's in the house. Next week, I will no longer have to subtract an hour from the clock in my car. It's 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 so funny because I see people commenting on those on social media all the time on those uh, car clocks. I uh, 
find them fairly easy to uh, to change. But some of them are really fiddly because they've only got one button, and it's all to do with the the duration of the press of the button, and it can be head wrecking. But anyway, that's funny. Uh, Sue, you're very welcome. SPCM is saying hello from Knock Nashi in County Sligo, where it is unsurprisingly damp. A very good evening to all my friends in the most fairy place in Ireland. Arc Astronomy Database saying Equinox greetings to Anthony and all the two. Oh, thank you so much, Ty. And uh, the same right back at you. Hope you're in good form. Karen Faye O'Loughlin is saying lovely spring greetings. Well, I, I, uh, I, I don't know whether you're commenting on the fact that I'm giving people lovely or that you're actually bestowing those upon us. But I would take it that you're bestowing lovely spring greetings upon us. And I accept those lovely spring greetings on behalf of all the Tua who are here, Karen. Thank you. Helen Hurst Chatter is saying happy equinox to all the Tua. Good evening to you, Helen, or good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Amy uh, Bachman, any ideas as to why Squire left out mention of Kernonos in his Myths and Legends? No, is the quick answer. <laughs> no, but as we will see, he lumped a lot of things into this word Britain or, you know, British and, and, and the British islands. And as I said in last week's episode, you need to just be aware of that. No doubt this will trigger some people. If it triggers you, please don't send me angry emails and messages. I don't want to know. He, he was writing at a time when Ireland was ostensibly still part of the British Empire. Uh, and that's the way he, that was the the world or the universe in which he lived. But as I said last week, uh, any book about Celtic mythology uh, is about seventy five percent Irish uh, mythology and twenty five percent everywhere else. Sandra Boothroyd is in the house. Greetings to you, Sandra. Barb Jordan is also here. Barb, I hope you're in good form. Great to see you. Tom King is in the house. Long time no talk, Tom. And uh, saying hope all in good fettle. Equinox greetings to one and all from the forge of the smooth road where the forge is hot. The anvil is uh, busy receiving the blows of the hammer and where the hammer itself is wielded by the great smith of the smooth road. Rex Fortebury, Arach Moore, Atua, Honadich. Uh, thank you, Rex, and uh, many greetings of the vernal equinox to you. Oh, brilliant. Uh, Mariana, good stuff. Um, lots of people saying hello to Adrian O'Beglin is in the house. What did you think of the rugby, uh, Adrian? But sure, I know what you thought of it. Uh, amazing, uh, well, not an amazing, actually, a little bit of a nerve wracking uh, game, uh, against England uh, at the Aviva to win the Grand Slam. And well done to the Irish uh, rugby team. Can't believe I've finally taken an interest in a ball sport but there you go it must be something to do with middle age elizabeth marks martinez says happy spring equinox many uh, happy returns to you elizabeth greetings of the season to you and all yours uh mal o o dovi is it dovelin st patrick's equinox and a grand slam need a rest <laughs> i can understand that don't forget that uh, saturday the 18th was Sheila's day, and uh, in in olden times, pre-famine days, Sheila's day was an excuse to keep up the old whiskey drinking after St Patrick's Day. Yeah, hair of the dog and all that. Johnny Wilson is saying hello from Dallas, Texas, where it's fifty-four Fahrenheit. Well, let's quickly translate that. Twelve point two. Yeah, exactly what Elaine said, and Elaine is in Texas as well. Uh, a very good afternoon to all our friends in Texas, and indeed in the United States and indeed in the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere all around the world. Uh, Lorraine CC, happy equinox. Uh, many happy returns to you. Astro made it on time. Brilliant stuff. Uh, glad to have you here. Adina Sparks is greeting all the two with a happy equinox. Thank you, Adina. Good evening and welcome. Lynn Murphy is sharing a green heart. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Amy Bachman says, Giagrich from uh, Chile, Iowa, by the way, and blessed spring greetings. Well, we're hoping that following this great day of spring equinox, that uh, it'll be less chilly and perhaps less damp uh, in times to come over the next uh, few weeks and months. 
Astro is greeting everybody with a happy equinox. Bernie Courtney says, good evening from a wet castle bar. I'm listening, but just dropped a stitch. So don't mind the cursing from me. Multitasking, knitting and listening is not my forte. <laughs> you need to pick it up again there, Bernie. Yeah, Don't be getting distracted by all these stories, you know. Still celebrating the double Grand Slam, says Adrian. Yeah, what a moment. Oh, I tell you what, they left it late, didn't they? You know, you're looking at the scoreboard, 11-10, just going, lads, you know, you kind of need to pull something out of the bag here, you know. But they did. Oh, they did. They certainly did. Tarini Pendleton has joined us. Is saying Banacht, Banachty, Anthony and the two a happy she Equinox and Sheila's Day. Thank you very much, Tarini. Michael Pike has joined us. Michael, good afternoon to you. Hope you're in good form. <clears throat> I seem to be a little bit on the horse side. That's not a good sign at the beginning of an episode. I will do my best. Helen celebrated St. Patrick's in Deadwood, South Dakota. Quite the scene, I can imagine that. You mean you caused a scene? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe one thing we forgot. Busy weekend, says Elaine. St. Patrick, Sheila, Mother's Day and Ireland winning. We need a week to recover. Mary Hills is saying, love all this from San Antonio in Texas. Good afternoon. Uh, yet another viewer from Texas. Mary, you're very, very welcome live irish myths and uh, i believe it's around uh, 54 fahrenheit where you are right now mm. unless the temperature across texas varies uh, wildly and of course it is possible that it varies certainly because it's such a big state isn't it so uh, apparently only irish people will get this but i want to read something to you shortly after i took off on an Aer Lingus flight from dublin to boston a few weeks ago Air, the air hostess nervously announced that the catering department had made a terrible mistake. A big mix-up, she said. Although 226 passengers boarded the plane, they received only 80 dinners, leaving quite a shortfall. She apologised, but said that anybody who is kind enough to give up their meal to somebody who is hungry would receive free unlimited drinks for the duration of the flight. The next announcement came two hours later when she said, if anybody is hungry, we still have 80 dinners available. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, brilliant. I hope you also enjoyed that. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, yes, that's the Irish for you, you know. Uh, and... Uh, Yes, I'm just looking for one more. Uh, my wife just confessed that she broke my favourite lamp. I don't think I'll be able to look at her in the same light again. <laughs> Helena Breen has joined us. I hope you're. I hope you joined us just in time to miss the awful jokes. <laughs> uh, yes. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I want to show off uh, for a second. Those of you who are following Mythical Ireland on Facebook, and I think Instagram uh, would have seen this, but this arrived on St. Patrick's Day. Amazon, take a day off. <laughs> the Amazon delivery guy arrived on St. Patrick's Day with uh, this wonderful book, Ancient Legends, Mystic Charms and Superstitions of Ireland by Lady Wilde. Wait till you see. The presentation of this book is wonderful. I mentioned this book, I think, on last week or the week before his live stream. And um, I also referenced it in that. Hang on, I need to silence my phone. Give me one moment, please. Um, we do not want to be interrupted by those kind of sounds all evening. Um. Yeah, I referenced this also in that very long article, a new article on my website, which is mostly based on something that I had originally released for patrons last year on St. Patrick's Day, which is a lengthy article about the myths and legends of St. Patrick. And there are really two St. Patrick's. There's this, well, there's actually several. There's the St. Patrick in his own words, the confessio and all that. He seems to have been, relatively speaking, a humble man. There is the St. Patrick that the church created, this person who brought Christianity to Ireland and, and got rid of the snakes and all that stuff. And then there's the mythological St. Patrick, who, whose stories are basically regurgitated uh, pagan or pre-Christian myths. 
And I referenced this because there's a, a very valuable, what I believe to be a very valuable reference in there to the story of St. Patrick um, defeating the, the, the great snake, uh, Crom Croch, uh, and casting it into the Boyne, which I say sounds very like a regurgitation or a retelling of the myth of the Mata, who, according to different versions of the Dunchamicus, was either defeated by the men of Ulster or the men of Ireland, or clubbed uh, in the water with uh, the, by the Dogda using his giant club. If you're interested in reading that article, um, it's about six and a half thousand words. It'll take you. It'll take you a while, but it's. Uh, I hope you find it of uh, great value. Something I will say before I, I continue on the subject of books about uh, Saint Patrick. Uh, I shared that article and I shared also a blog post on the same evening about um, what uh, Prager had written uh, in terms of the myth of Saint Patrick banishing the snakes and that there were never any snakes in Ireland. It seems that St. Patrick is a very major trigger for some angry people. Now, some of these people fall under the umbrella of paganism or neo-paganism. And I wouldn't like to, and I definitely wouldn't consider tarring uh, everybody with the same brush. I know that Mythical Ireland has a lot of followers who identify as pagans. And I know a lot of pagans and I have great time and respect for them. But there's a certain branch of modern paganism, and I know most of you won't, wouldn't associate with it, who have this idea uh, propagated on social media that St. Patrick was sent to Ireland by the Romans to eradicate the Druids and that he committed genocide, for which there's no evidence. I mean, yes, he does battle with the Druids uh, uh, of Tara at Slane. Yes, there's a mention, I think, somewhere of him throwing a Druid into the air. Uh, and yes, he is supposed to have destroyed the idol of Crom Croak. Uh, but uh, the evidence for genocide, I'm sorry, it's not just that it's uh, scanty. It just doesn't exist. And the number of comments on those posts left me wondering about the state of humankind. And I think it's just part of a, a, a wider trend uh, where people are just reading something on the Internet, immediately accepting it because uh, it conforms to their own uh, twisted beliefs and then getting angry with anybody who challenges that, even if the person who challenges it is somebody who knows more about it. I'm not talking about me. I've said se several people who made those sort of comments were challenged by others. Uh, and the threads under those posts on the Mythical Ireland page on Facebook and the Mythical Ireland community, for example, the threads of comments on those are interesting to read. It's frightening, actually, uh, the sort of rubbish that people ha have begun to believe in this modern age. Uh, as I say, I said it to Morgan Daimler, who made a lot of posts over the last number of days about this subject, that we're supposedly living in the age of information which is what we were told 20 years ago at the outset or in the early days of the internet, actually we're, we seem to be le now living in the age of uh, the uh, mis in, uh, misinformation, uh, the misinformation age. Uh, and another thing that people kept telling me was, the snakes are a metaphor, dummy. And I kept saying, actually, the later church figures, those who created the... Um, those who created the, the, the larger story of Patrick, the, those who made him the founder of the church, those who wanted Armagh to be the seat of that church, actually used the fact that the snakes were, lar were missing, not largely, they were completely absent from Ireland as proof that St. Patrick had performed miracles. So no, they weren't actually meant as a metaphor, although it is possible that the snake uh, and the serpent in earlier pre-Christian myth represents a metaphor. Um, yeah, a huge amount of nonsense. It's and it's terrible. I mean, yeah, we. I understand. So I've done a lot of work in terms of my writing, where I'm trying to interpret mythology. But look, it's an interpretation. You can't state it as fact all the time. The problem is people were stating stuff as fact that the snakes represented the druids, and he killed the druids. He committed genocide against them. And as I say, there's no evidence for that. Now, if you want to have a discussion about it, at the very least, look at the sources. You know, there's enough early material about St. Patrick, you know, uh, there really is. Uh, before I continue, and, and I will momentarily because I've just had a rant and rant is now over, ladies and gentlemen. You can relax. You can pick back up your mug of hot tea because I wouldn't want you dropping it and scalding yourself in the lap. Uh, Sean Patter says in pre-Christian times, Croak Patrick was known as Croak and Igla. Some believe the older name is connected to a pagan harvest deity, the dark 
God, Crumb Crook, later known as Crumb Dove. Yeah, absolutely. And the battle between Patrick and Crumb Dove is very like, in my view, is very like, for instance, the battle between Lou and Balor. It's about uh, uh, a good deity defeating a bad deity. It's, again, probably a regurgitation of older myth. Uh, Karen Faye says, love the granular detail uh, untangling the various threads of myths, as do I. And I suppose we can never say that something is completely true or completely untrue. Uh, I don't want to brush it completely aside as if to suggest that it's not possible that the snakes represented pagans. It's just that the evidence is not there. Um, you know, there wasn't actually uh, people continued to be pagan or have their own uh, beliefs long, long after Christianity had become established in Ireland. And then don't forget eventually that a lot of the bards uh, who had uh, preserved the older lore were subsumed into the monasteries after the arrival of the Normans, you know. Super interesting. Before you even start tonight, says Sonia Hogan. Well, I'm glad that I wasn't uh, uh, putting everybody off with a little bit of a rant. Kathy May Dayo is in the house. Uh, so I'm so late, almost missed today, at home sick with COVID. Oh no, this stuff is horrible. I'm glad I got in on the end to say hello. I'm starting to feel a little bit better. Well, you'd be glad to hear we're only just starting. Uh, Kathy May, but uh, best wishes to you for a speedy recovery. Uh, that thing can be quite nasty, as I found out for myself. Mary Hill, Hill, is it Hills? Can't understand why they always get on the Jews. My goodness, Jesus was a Jew and religion was all man made. Thank you for your explanation. Well, I, I just find that there's so much, uh, just you know, um. I, I, I like to interpret and I love the, uh, like, myth is rich in metaphorical symbolism and imagery. And it's lovely to try and disentangle that. Don't get me wrong. We are all trying to add uh, to the interpretation. However, stating something as fact, uh, as historical fact, when there's nothing to support it, uh, you know, and there were discussions too about then people started saying oh, oh, the Irish are the tribe of Dan, the lost tribe of Dan and all that British Israelite nonsense. I have to do, uh, I'm going to, I am at some point going to write something quite lengthy about that. I wrote some, a little something about it after the attack on the Leah foil because uh, Tara has suffered from attacks in the past uh, based on uh, religious uh, bigotry, basically. Um, and anyway, it's a subject I need to come back to and park for now. Uh, Gordon Farrell has joined. Missed your point. It looks interesting. Well, Gordon, you will be able to replay at the end. So hopefully, um, and yeah, I hope it doesn't, uh, as I say, uh, it's not really the mood of this live stream. I don't do many rants. Uh, Mary says she loves it. I don't do many rants. I just don't think it's me. Uh, Anna L is in the house. Good evening, Anna L. Welcome to the live stream. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, I find it difficult to know which sources of info are the least biased when it comes to what's shared online, as Celtic information is pretty limited in the US, as Amy. Yeah, well, I suppose um, one of the benefits of following Mythical Ireland, if I can blow my own trumpet, is that I do like to reference the sources. And I do, when a source is a little bit dodgy, I will say that. And when a source is completely dodgy, I won't use it. Um, so hopefully you get a little bit of help with your sources here. Um Yes, Karen Fay is pointing out that don't forget that we are still, there's a, a smaller time difference between Ireland and the States and Canada at the moment due to the fact that, uh, am I right in saying Canada? Did you all spring forward or was it just the States? Ye sprang forward uh, last week, uh, Saturday a week ago. We're only springing forward next Saturday and then the times will be back to the usual. So for the moment, uh, you might seem as if it's an hour out. I'm starting at the same time as I always do, but it might seem as if it's an hour late uh, for you guys. Uh, Anne McCallum has joined us. Hope everyone's well. We're enjoying a lovely four Celsius. <laughs> With gorgeous sunshine, well, at least the sun is shining. Spring has definitely sprung, at least for today, and we are sincerely thankful for it. Well, hopefully the days are getting longer and brighter and warmer for you, Anne, and thanks for joining us and for your comment. Um, 
There is some evidence of the tradition worship or offerings being made to Crom Crook until sometime in the 1600s. Records of leaving of milk and honey on makeshift altars in the Leitrim area. Well, some aspects of what we might call pre-Christian culture survived right into the modern age. I, I've said it before and I've written about it, about the fact that uh, some people who were devoutly Catholic in the 20th century privately had an entirely different belief going on, you know, something they didn't tell the priest at mass, you know, um, which is interesting. Mavanway Millward has joined. I should be working, but couldn't miss you all. I might sneak off quietly later. I hope everyone's well and had a grand St. Patrick's Day. Yes, we did indeed. Mavanway, good to see you. And don't worry, because if you have to sneak off, you can come back again and watch the replay. But it's good that we got to say hello and to give you a mention. Joseph Akirja is in the house. Gia, uh, Gia August Banjia, which uh, Joseph. Uh, Mary Hills, thank you. It's wonderful. And you're beautiful. And you're beautiful. Thank you. Love your accent. <laughs> <laughs> ah yes i'm irish and proud um yeah i i i i i have to say I, I i'm not at all biased and i say entirely objectively that the irish accent is the best accent in the world i appreciate that keeping things accurate is so important to you so sharon well yes but if you've read enough of my work you'll know that i do try the interpretive stuff but i'm always cautious with it i think i'm honest about it is the point where you're speculating or hypothesizing, you're saying that. You're saying, this is what is actually said, and this is my interpretation of it. Um, it's the people who say with so much certainty, this is the case, this happened, this was blah, 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 blah. And uh, they've no evidence for it. And sure, look, you know, you needn't go looking for it. Sean Patter. In fact, there's a wishing chair on Nochnishi that looks towards Crow Patrick. Some think it's related to Crumb Dove and the Hills. Lunasa links. Mm, I wonder. Uh, I don't know about that. It'd be worth sitting on that chair uh, at the at, at especially at that uh, Lunasa time and seeing where the sun sets. <sighs> yeah, Sotonar says, "Yep." There's a quote from a priest in rural Munster I've always liked. "Quote: It's a thin veneer of Christianity we have over these people." Unquote. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which I always say, if you want an example of, you know, uh, Christianity came and, and taught us the meaning of the crucifix, you know, and gave us the cross. Like, well, just look inside Newgrange. There's a crucifix in there that predates Christianity by about 3,000 years, you know. And the introduction, it predates the introduction of Christianity to Ireland by 3,500 years. Anyway, this was the book. Now, one thing I will say about this. Uh, so I ordered this on Amazon, uh, published by Sirius Publishing. A division of Arcturus Publishing. I love the fact that they've named their publishing companies after stars in 2001. Just a warning about this. It's a beautiful book, beautifully produced. It's in the presentation box. It's got the Wibbelin green cover with the gold inlaid text and the Celtic pattern in black. Feels gorgeous in the hand. Is printed very well. It's just a beautiful production. One small problem. Lady Wilde's Ancient Legends, Mystic Charms and Superstitions of Ireland was published in two volumes. From what I can see, this volume, which the uh, foreword says is an abridged version, contains either all or nearly all of volume one, but only less than half of volume two. Just be aware of it. Now, it just so happens that if you're on archive.org or Gutenberg or one of those sites, um, What's that one? Um, oh, the one with all the links to Irish material to the download. Is it Van? Uh, I can't remember it. And I won't say it in case I'm wrong. You can download PDF copies, which are facsimile copies of the original volumes. So you can have the entirety of volume one and volume two on your computer, as I do. And I bought this thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful to have it all in book form? And unfortunately, it's not all in there. So just something to be aware of. And to be aware of in general when you're buying um, uh, modern reprints or copies uh, of older work that you don't always get what you think you're getting. Uh, the other book, I, did I mention this one last week? Hang on. 13th of March. I think I might have done. Yeah, The Rhizome on the Flower. I think I did. The Perennial Philosophy of Yeats and Young. And having read a bit of it, um, yeah, I think I did mention it. Um, basically, the, the premise of the book is to compare the work of Young and Yeats and to say that there are a lot of similarities. But the author says early on in the book that there's no evidence to suggest that Young 
and Yates had actually ever met, although apparently there was a bookshop in Dublin uh, that they both frequented. And it is known that uh, Jung had a copy of Yates's vision, but he apparently said he'd never read it. And Yates may have had uh, one or two of Jung's work. Of course, that was before uh, Jung had produced his immense body of work. Um, the Celtic cross has existed for longer than Christianity. It's true. It is actually true in a way. Just finished a piece on the calendar of Amergin, a poem from the Book of Invasions. I'll share on mythical creators. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Gordon, uh, look forward to seeing that. <clears throat> so we are returning tonight. So what time are we on? Half past eight. Look at that. Half an hour has elapsed already. Where does the time go? Time flies when you're having fun. Or as we say in Ireland, time flies when you're having a rant <laughs> about um, yeah, people who have bigoted uh, views and twisted uh, facts and, well, alternative facts. Don't go there, folks. Don't. No, that's not. No, let's not do that. Let's. What? Another Anthony. Shut up. Stop interrupting. <laughs> Um, and if you're interested in the uh, snakes article in relation to St. Patrick, uh, that is also on the Mythical Ireland website over at mythicalireland.com. Uh, Mavanway says correctly, time flies when you're talking about books. It certainly does. So uh, chapter three of Charles Squire's book is called Who Were the, quote, ancient Britons, unquote, question mark. <clears throat> now, I did give this um, caveat at the beginning of last week's episode, and I'm giving it again. I've said it already in this episode, but just if you're watching this back and you're suddenly getting angry about the appropriation of Irish mythology into British mythology, that's there's no need to get political about it. Uh, this man who, who was British was writing in 1912 at a time when uh, Ireland was part of the British Empire and uh, when uh, it may have suited certain scholars uh, to uh, describe Ireland as being British. He does make the differentiation in most cases by referring to us as the Gaels and to our mythology as Gaelic mythology. Uh, and he refers to the British islands, which he's clearly, you know, I mean, that has survived into the modern era, much as some Irish people don't like it. Um, you know, that uh, notion of of just calling the islands of Britain and Ireland the British Isles. Um, <clears throat> some Irish people don't like that, and probably understandably, but we don't get political about these things. We're interested in uh, the things that unify uh, humankind, not the things that divide us. But before proceeding, he says, uh, this is the man who has read lots and lots of tales about battles between various factions and kings and uh, the Danans and Fomorians and Fervolog and Milesians and all that stuff. But you know what I, you know where I'm coming from. <clears throat> Irish technical thinker has just arrived just in time by the looks of it. Just in the nick of time and just about to start the reading. But you missed all the fun, the rant, the good jokes. Wait, was were there good jokes? You be the judge of that. The good jokes, the bad jokes the chat, the conversation, and the hellos. But before proceeding to recount the myths of the, again, he uses quotes, ancient Britons, unquote, it will be well to decide what people exactly we mean by that loose but convenient phrase. We are all of us vague, we have all of us vague ideas of ancient Britons, recollected doubtless from our school books, there we saw their pictures as, painted with woad, they paddled coracles or drove scythed chariots through legions of astonished Romans. Of course, we're not thinking about the Irish here because the Romans never came to Ireland, people say. Some people say they were too scared. Their druids, white bearded and wearing long white robes, cut the mistletoe with a golden sickle at the time of the full moon or less, innocent, less innocently employed made bonfires of human beings shut up in gigantic figures of wicker work. Burning at the stake, anyone? She's a witch burner! <laughs> uh, Monty Python again. Such picturesque details were little short of the sum total, not only of our own knowledge of the subject, but also that of our teachers. Practically all their information concerning the ancient inhabitants of Britain was taken 
from the commentaries of Julius Caesar. Bloody Romans. <laughs> yes, Marcus, I know, I know. Uh, we could, we could have, yes. This could descend into a mighty, mighty, Monty Python-esque farce. Uh, so far as it went, it was no doubt correct, but it did not go far. Caesar's interest in our British ancestors was that of a general who was his own war, war correspondent rather than that of an exhaustive and painstaking scientist. It has been reserved for modern archaeologists, philologists and ethnologists to give us a fuller account of the ancient Britons. I have to say I like that word Britons. It, it's, it, it has a feeling of sort of, it rolls off the tongue very well. The inhabitants of our islands previous to the Roman invasion, not saying I identify with it in case you're wondering, but we have lots of viewers from Britain who are all very good friends of ours. We're not fighting these days, we're friends. <laughs> How do you know she's a witch? Yeah, uh, uh, they weighed, what was it about the duck? And a stone. Oh, somebody will tell me. The inhabitants of our islands previous to the Roman invasion are generally described as, quote, Celts, unquote. But they must have been largely a mixed race. And the people with whom they mingled must have modified to some and perhaps to a large extent their physique, their customs and their language. Speculation has run somewhat wild over the question of the composition of the early Britons. But out of the clash of rival theories, there emerges one and one only, which may be considered as scientifically established. We have certain proof of two distinct human stocks in the British islands at the time of the Roman conquest. And so great an authority as Professor Huxley has given his opinion that there is no evidence of any others. Of course, this is all uh, not completely redundant. Uh, but has all been obviously superseded by later research uh, and the modern genetic research is revealing remarkable things uh, about the for instance genetic makeup of the modern populations of ireland and britain the earliest of these two races would seem to have inhabited our islands from the most ancient times and may for our purpose be described as aboriginal he's probably here referring to the mesolithic or hunter gatherer people it was the people that built the long barrows and which is variously called by ethnologists the Iberian, Mediterranean, Berber, Basque, Silurian or Euscarian race. In physique it was short, swarthy, dark haired, dark eyed and long skulled. Its language belonged to the class called Hamatic and surviving types of which, sorry, the surviving types of which are found among the Gallus, Abyssinians, Berbers, and other North African tribes. And it seems to have come originally from some part of either Eastern, Northern, or Central Africa. Spreading thence, it was probably the first people to inhabit the Valley of the Nile, and it sent offshoots into Syria and Asia Minor. The earliest Hellenes found it in Greece under the name of Pel Pelasgoi, the earliest Latins in Italy as the Etruscans and the Hebrews in Palestine as the Hittites. It spread northward through Europe as far as the Baltic and westward along the, the Atlas chain to Spain, France and our own islands. In many countries, it reached a comparatively high level of civilization, but in Britain, its development must have been early checked. We can discern it as an agricultural rather than a pastoral people, still in the Stone Age. So he's, he's talking about the Neolithic people here, not the Mesolithic. Dwelling in totemistic tribes on hills whose summits it fortified elaborately and whose slopes it cultivated on what is called the terrace system and having a primitive culture, which ethnologists think to have much resembled that of the present hill tribes of southern India. I disregard this chapter as a, an introduction to uh, the... Uh, uh, ethnological or genetic history of Ireland and Britain. It held our islands till the coming of the Celts, who fought with the Aborigines, dispossessed them of the more fertile parts, subjugated them, even amal amalgamated with them, but certainly never extirpated them. This is a ring of truth to it in terms of if you believe that the Celts weren't actually the Iron Age uh, people, uh, it wasn't an Iron Age arrival as, as such, that it may well have been a Bronze Age arrival. 
in the time of the Romans, they were still practically independent in South Wales. In Ireland, they were long unconquered and are found as allies rather than serfs of the Gaels, ruling their own provinces and preserving their own customs and religion. Nor, in spite of all the successive invasions of Great Britain and Ireland, are they yet extinct or so merged as to have lost their type, which is still the predominant one in many parts of the West, both of Britain and Ireland, and is believed by some ethnologists to be generally upon the increase all over England. The second of the two races was the exact opposite to the first. It was the tall, fair, light-haired, blue or grey-eyed, broad-headed people called popularly the Celts, who belonged in speech to the Aryan family, their language finding its affinities in Latin, Greek, Teutonic, Slavic, the Zend of ancient Persia and the Sanskrit of ancient India. Its original home was probably somewhere in central Europe, along the course of the upper Danube or in the region of the Alps. The round barrows in which it buried its dead or deposited their burnt ashes differ in shape from the long barrows of the early race. Of course, when he's talking about long barrows here, he's talking about an exclusively British monument uh, because we don't actually have long barrows in Ireland. But from the Neolithic, we have, of course, many different tomb types, the passage tomb being predominant. Yes, I think. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the numbers. It was in a high state stage of culture it was in a higher stage of culture than the Iberians and introduced into Britain bronze and silver and perhaps some of the more lately domesticated animals. Both Iberians and Celts were divided into numerous tribes, but there is nothing to show that there was any great diversity among the former. It is otherwise with the Celts, who were separated into two main branches, which came over at different times. The earliest were the Gaels. Uh, it, there's two spellings of that, G-O-I-D-E-L-S or G-A-E-L-S. The second, the Brythons, B-R-Y-T-H-O-N-S or Britons, B-R-I-T-O-N-S. Between these two branches, there was not only a dialectical, but probably also a considerable physical difference. Some anthropologists even postulate a different shape of skull. Without necessarily admitting this, there is reason to suppose a difference of build and colour of hair. That actually has turned out to be true because the Neolithic population uh, and the Bronze Age, uh, the Beaker people who came afterwards, are uh, uh, genetically diverse. Catherine Perry has joined us from Southern California. Very good afternoon to you, Catherine, just past the middle of the day there. Uh, 18 minutes to nine at night here. A Roman era pillar was excavated in the west of England, Gordon Farrell tells us, with Ohm from Ireland on it, an Irish merchant who lived in England, two isles with a rich history together. Correct and right. Sotonar might take it back if the stream is long enough. It must be off. Slán, Slán Gafol as I'm inclined to say uh, at the end of uh, the uh, broadcasts. With regard to this, we have the evidence of Latin writers, of Tacitus, who tells us that the Caledonians of the north differed from the southern Britons in being large, larger limbed and redder haired, and of Strabo, who described the, the tribes in the interior of Britain as taller than the Gaulish colonists on the coast, with, their, with hair less yellow and limbs more loosely knit. Equally, do the classic authorities agree in recognising the Silures of South Wales as an entirely different race from any other in Britain? The dark complexions and curly hair of these Iberians seemed to Tacitus to prove them immigrants from Spain. Professor Rees also puts forward evidence to show that the Gaels and the Brythons had already separated before they first left Gaul for our islands. He finds them as two distinct peoples there, we do not expect so much nowadays from the merest schoolboy as we did in Macaulay's time. But even the modern descendant of that paragon could probably tell us that all Gaul was divided into three parts, one of which was, inha uh, was inhabited by the Belgae, another by the Aquitaini, and the third by those who call themselves Celtae, but were termed Galli by the Romans and that they all differed from one another in language, customs, and laws. Of these, Professor Rees identifies the Belgae with the Brythons, the Celtae with the Gaels, and the third people, the Aquitaini, being non-Celtic and non-Aryan, part of the great Hamitic-speaking Iberian stock. Uh, 
The Celtae, with their Gaelic dialect of Celtic, which survives today in the Gaelic languages of Ireland, Scotland and the Isle of Man, were the first to come over to Britain, pushed forward probably by the Belgae, who Caesar tells us were the bravest of the Gauls. Here they conquered the na native Iberians, driving them out of the fertile parts into the rugged districts of the north and west. Later came the Belgae themselves, compelled by press of population, and they, bringing better weapons and a higher civilization, treated the Gaels as those had treated the Iberians. Thus harried, the Gaels probably combined with the Iberians against what was now the common foe. As soon as I mentioned common foe, Coda Burke, and became to a large degree amalgamated with them. The result was that during the Roman domination, the British islands were roughly divided with regard to race as follows. The Brythons, or second Celtic race, held all Britain south of the Tweed, with the exception of the extreme west, while the first Celtic race, the Gaelic, G-O-I-D-E-L-I-C, had most of Ireland, as well as the Isle of Man, Cumberland, the West Highlands, Cornwall, Devon and North Wales. <laughs> Coda is rather excited about a visitor who has just arrived in the house. North of the Grampians lived the Picts, who were probably more or less Gaelicized Iberians, the Aboriginal race also holding out unmixed in South Wales and parts of Ireland. It is now time to decide what, for the purposes of this book, it would be best to call the two different branches of the Celts and their languages. With such familiar terms as Gael and Britain, Gaelic and British, ready to our hands, it seems pedantic to insist upon a more technical Gael, as in G-O-I-D-E-L, and Brython, B-R-Y-T-H-O-N, or Gaelic and Brythonic. The difficult... Yes, Coda is going apeshit. Sorry, uh, the difficulty is that the words Gael and Gaelic have been so long popularly used to designate only the modern Gaels of Scotland and their language, that they may create confusion when also applied to the people and languages of Ireland and the Isle of Man. Similarly, the words Britain and British have come to mean at the present day the people of the whole of the British Islands, though they at first only signified the inhabitants of England, Central Wales, the lowlands of Scotland, and the, the Brythonic colony in Brittany. However, the words Gael and Brython with their derivatives are so clumsy that it will probably prove best to use the neater terms. In this volume, therefore, the Gaels of Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man are, are Gaels, G-A-E-L-S, and the Brythons of Ar England and Wales are, are Britons, B-R-I-T-O-N-S. We get the earliest accounts of the life of the inhabitants of the British islands from two sources. The first is a foreign one, that of the Latin writers. But the Romans only really knew the southern Britons, whom they described as similar in physique and customs to the continental Gauls, with whom, indeed, they considered them to be identical. At the time they wrote, colonies of Belgae were still settling upon the coasts of Britain opposite to Gaul. Roman information grew scantier as it approached the wall, and of the northern tribes they seem to have had only such knowledge as they gathered through occasional warfare with them. They described them as entirely barbarous, naked and tattooed, living by the chase alone, without towns, houses or fields, without government or family life, sounds like, doesn't it? No taxes. <laughs> and regarding iron as an ornament of value or, or uh, as other more civilised peoples regarded gold. Nothing wrong with a bit of iron or a little bit of mild black steel around your neck. As for Ireland, it never came under their direct observation, as I said earlier. And we are entirely dependent upon its native writers for information as to the manners and customs of the Gaels. It may be considered convincing proof of the authenticity of the descriptions of life contained in the ancient Gaelic manuscripts that they corroborate so completely the observations of the Latin writers upon the Britons and Gauls. Reading the two side by side, 
we may largely reconstruct the common civilization of the Celts. Josie Weatherford is in the house. Hello there, Josie. Long time no see. As a very, uh, well, first of all, a happy vernal equinox to you. I hope you had uh, a nice St. Patrick's and St. Sheila's weekend. Roughly speaking, one may compare it with the civilization of the Greeks. <laughs> Gordon is laughing at the no taxes thing. <laughs> Ah, yes. Isn't it great? No taxes, but everybody's hacking each other to bits and everybody's running around naked and tattooed. And, uh, you know, your food for the day is something that you have to hunt or chase down in the forest. Roughly speaking, one may compare it with the civilization of the Greeks, as described by Homer. Both peoples were in the tribal and pastoral stage of culture in which the chiefs were the great cattle owners sorry, in which the chiefs are the great cattle owners round whom their less wealthy fellows gather. Both wear much the same attire, use the same kind of weapons and fight in the same manner from the war chariot, a vehicle already obsolete even in Ireland by the first century of the Christian era. Battles are fought single-handedly between chiefs, the ill-armed common people contributing little to their result and less to their history. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Such chiefs are said to be divinely descended sons even of the immortal gods. <coughs> their tremendous feats are sung by the bards who, like the Homeric poets, were privileged persons inferior only to the warlord ancient greek and ancient celt had very much the same conceptions of life both as regards this world and the next peter kennedy has joined us from balbriggan a bit late as i'm trying on close combinations for the new job congratulations and uh, i hope that it's a good one uh best of luck for it Hope that means you're going to be able to watch more live Irish bits. Polly, uh, Polly Mathing, Polly, Polly Mathing saying, sending love to all of the Sequinox from a Lewis living in Canada. Well, hello and good afternoon, Polly Mathing. You're very welcome to the live stream. Uh, make yourself comfortable. I hope you have a great time here. We may gather much detailed information of the early inhabitants of the British islands from our various authorities. Their clothes, which consisted, according to the Latin writers, of a blouse with sleeves, trousers fitting closely around the ankles, and a shawl or cloak fastened at the shoulder with a brooch, were made either of thick felt or of woven cloth dyed with various brilliant colours. The writer Diodorus tells us that they were crossed with little squares and lines as though they had been sprinkled with flowers. They were in fact like tartans and we may believe varro who tells us that they quote made a gaudy show unquote the men alone seem to have worn hats which were a soft of of soft felt the woman's hair being uncovered and tied in a knot behind in time of battle the men also dispensed with any head covering brushing their abundant hair forward into a thick mass and dyeing it red with a soap made of goat's fat and beech ashes. Until they looked, says Cicero, uh, Cicero's tutor Poseidonus, who visited Britain around 110 BC, less like human beings than wild men of the woods. Both sexes were fond of ornaments, which took the form of gold bracelets, rings, pins and brooches, and of beads of amber, glass, and jet. Their knives, daggers, spearheads, axes, and swords were made of bronze or iron. Their shields were the same round target used by the Highlanders at the Battle of Culloden, and they seem to have had a kind of lasso to which a hammer-shaped ball was attached, and which they used as the gauchos of South America used their bola. And I don't really know what he's talking about too much there, to be honest. So I'll just keep moving on. Their war chariots were made of wicker, the wooden wheels being armed with sickles of bronze. These were drawn either by two or four horses and were large enough to hold several persons in each. 
Standing in these, they rushed along the enemy lines, hurling darts and driving the sides against all who came within reach. The Romans were very much impressed by the skill of the drivers who, quote, could check their horses at full speed on a steep incline and turn them in an instant and could run along the pole and stand on the yoke and then get back into their chariots again without a moment's delay, unquote. With these accounts of the Roman writers, we may compare the picture of the Gaelic hero Cúchulainn, as the ancient Irish writers describe him dressed and armed for battle. Glorified by the bard, he yet wears essentially the same costume and equipment which the classic historians and geographers described more soberly. Quote, his gorgeous raiment that he wore in great conventions, unquote, consisted of Quote, a fair crimson tunic of five plies and fringed with a long pin of white silver, gold enchased and patterned, shining as if it had been a luminous torch, which for its blazing property and brilliance, men might not endure to see. Next, his skin, a body vest of silk, bordered and fringed all round with gold, with silver and with white bronze which vest came as far as the upper edge of his russet-coloured kilt. About his neck were a hundred linklets of red gold that flashed again, with pendants hanging from them. His headgear was adorned with a hundred mixed carbuncle jewels strung, unquote. He carried, quote, a trusty special shield in hue dark crimson and in, a, in its circumference armed with a pure white silver rim. At his left side, a long and golden hilted sword. Beside him in the chariot, a lengthy spear, together with a keen aggression boding javelin, fitted with hurling thong with rivets of white bronze, unquote. Another passage of Gaelic saga describes his chariot, it was made of fine wood with wickerwork moving on wheels of white bronze. It had a high rounded frame of creaking copper, a strong curved yoke of gold and a pole of white silver. With mountings of white bronze. No, I did not try to yawn there. I didn't, honestly. Saskia is on her way to... Hi, Sass. She needs to go out. If you gotta go, you gotta go. The yellow reins were pl plaited and the shafts were as hard and straight as sword blades. In like manner, the ancient Irish writers have made glorious the halls and fortresses of their mythical kings. Like the palaces of Priam, of Menelaus, Menelaus, pronunciation Anthony please and of Odysseus they gleam with gold and gems Concovar or Crohor the legendary king of Ulster in its golden age had three such houses at Awan Macha of the one called the red branch we are told that it contained nine compartments of red yew partitioned by walls of bronze all grouped around the king's private chamber which had a ceiling of silver and bronze pillars adorned with gold and carbuncles. And that is from the story Tuchmark Emera. Not Tuchmark Etain, the wooing of Etain. No, Tuchmark Emera, the wooing of Emer. Uh, Polymathing is saying, Shh, don't invoke him again. Yes, indeed. I, you might be talking about Coda. A visit to, is it Hochdorf in Stuttgart is a must. If you want to see a Celtic chieftain's burial with chariot, wow, says Gordon. But the far less magnificent accounts of the Latin writers have, no doubt, more truth in them than such lavish pictures. They describe the Britons they knew as living in villages of beehive huts, roofed with fern or thatch, from which, at the approach of an enemy, they retired to the local dune or fort. This, so far from being elaborate, merely consisted of a round or oval space fenced in with palisades and earthworks, and situated either upon the top of a hill or in the midst of a not easily traversable morass. We may see the remains of such strongholds in many parts of England. Notable ones are the castles of Amesbury, Avebury, 
the old and old Sarum in Wiltshire, St. Catherine's Hill near Winchester, St. George's Hill in Surrey. And it is probable that, in spite of the Celtic praisers of the past days, the palaces of Awanmaka and Tara were very like them. The Celtic customs were like the Homeric, those of the primitive world. All land, though it may have theoretically belonged to the, to the chief, was cultivated in common. This community of possessions is stated by Caesar to have extended to their wives, but the imputation cannot be said to have been proved. I'm not sure I want to even think too much about what he meant by that. On the contrary, in the stories of both branches of the Celtic race, women seem to have taken a higher place in men's estimation and to have enjoyed far more personal liberty than among the Homeric Greeks. The idea may have arisen from a misunderstanding of some of the curious Celtic customs. Descent seems to have been traced through the maternal rather than through the paternal line, a very un-Aryan procedure I apologise for the yawning, which some believe to have been borrowed from another race. I'm catching up on the long St. Patrick's, St. Sheila's weekend. <clears throat> the parental, <clears throat> excuse me, forgive me. The parental relation was still further lessened by the custom of sending children to be brought up outside the family in which they were born so that they had foster parents to whom they were as much or even more attached than to their natural ones. Their political state, mirroring their family life, was not less primitive. There was no central tribunal. Disputes were settled within the families in which they occurred, while in the case of graver injuries, the injured party or his nearest relation could kill the culprit or exact a fine from him. Yes, death or a fine, whichever you want. It's fine by me. <laughs> Stop, I'm to keep reading, Anthony. I don't think anyone noticed. There might be one or two tittering in the back of the classroom. As families increased in number, they became petty tribes, often at war with one another. A defeated tribe had to recognise the sovereignty of the head man of the conquering tribe. And a succession of such victories exalted him into the position of a chief of his district. But even then, though his decision was the whole of the law, it was little more than the mouthpiece of public opinion. Uh, that is the end of that chapter. Um, and to be honest, this is a book that definitely gets better as it goes along, uh, because we will be dealing with the Fomorians and the Tua de Danon and the Battle of Moitura and the coming of the Milesians and all of that. And later on, Finn and the Fina and all of that stuff, uh, and Cucullan and uh, the Thorn. So there, there's lots of really good stuff to come. Do we want to continue tonight by continuing into Chapter 4, which is the religion of the ancient Britons and Druidism, or do we want to leave it there for this week? It's only, you see, I've only actually been reading for half an hour, even though the episode is an hour, uh, because I spent half an hour um, saying hello and telling stupid jokes. Maternal makes sense before DNA because you always knew who the mother was, but you could never be sure about the father. Very true. Read on, Macduff, and we will continue. Uh, seems to be uh, an early um, consensus. So thank you for that. And I think I'm going to have to let Saskia in in a moment. Um, maybe this is a good time to let Saskia in. Uh, hold that thought there, folks, for one second while I let... Uh, the uh, lady dog in and uh, hopefully can get past her get her past coda without too much trauma
Well, that was a bit of an ordeal and a half. <sighs> ah, go on, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> I'm listening while I work, so please keep going. <laughs> uh, yes, this is chapter four, the religion of the ancient Britons and Druidism. The ancient inhabitants of Britain, the Gaelic and British Celts, have al been already described as forming a branch of what are roughly called the Aryans. Of course, that word is not really used today, isn't it? Not for reasons of, um, well, for reasons associated with the Nazis, you know. This name has, however, little reference to race and really signifies the speakers of a group of languages which can all be shown to be connected and to descend remotely from a single source, a hypothetical mother tongue spoken by a hypothetical people who we term Aryan or more correctly Indo-European. And that is indeed the phrase or term that is used in modern times. Aryan has gone out of fashion. We go to a mythical commercial break. <laughs> this primeval speech evolved probably upon some part of the great plain which stretches from the mountains of Central Europe to the mountains of Central Asia, has spread superseding or amalgamating with the tongues of other races until branches of it are spoken over almost the whole of Europe and a great portion of Asia. Sean Patter thinks it's an interesting book and keep going. Yes, indeed, I hope, I think. I agree with the cat, please continue. <laughs> Dog, doggy scuffle must greet. Yeah. Cut it just every single time. Saskia needs to go out. She, he's like, you know, he starts playing with her and uh, blocking her. And of course, in, rather than taking the short way around, she takes the long way around and it just ends up being very funny. Sometimes annoying because it takes her so long to get round him. And, it's like, and sometimes you have to say, Cut it, just leave her alone. All the various Latin, Greek, Slavic, Teutonic and Celtic languages are Aryan, in other words, Indo-European, as well as Persian and other Asiatic dialects derived from the ancient Zend and the numerous Indian languages which trace their origin to Sanskrit. Not very long ago, it was supposed that this common descent of language involved a common descent of blood. A real brotherhood was enthusiastically claimed for all the principal European nations who were also invited to recognize Hindus and Persians as their long lost cousins. Since then, it has been conceded that while the Aryan speech survived, though greatly modified, the Aryan blood might well have disappeared, diluted beyond recognition by crossing with the other races whom the Aryans conquered or among whom they more or less peacefully settled. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> there are no European nations, perhaps no people at all except a few remote savage tribes, which are not made up of the most diverse elements. Aryan and non-Aryan long ago blended inextricably to form by their fusion new peoples. Something that a lot of uh, uh, modern nationalists uh, could uh, do with a lesson on. They called me Mrs. I presume you mean Mrs. Doyle at work, as I always walk to my desk carrying three cups of tea. <laughs> uh, go on, go on, go on. Uh, but just as the Aryan speech influenced the new languages and the Aryan customs, the new civilizations, so we can still discern in the religions of the Aryan speaking nations similar ideas and expressions pointing to an original source of mythological conceptions. Hence, whether we investigate the mythology of the Hindus, the Greeks, the Teutons, or the Celts, we find the same mythological groundwork. In each, we see the powers of nature personified and endowed with human form and attributes, though bearing, with few exceptions, different names. Like the Vedic Brahmans, the Greek and Latin poets, and the Norse skulls, the Celtic bards, whether Gaels or Britons, Imagine the sky, the sun, the moon, the earth, the sea, and the dark underworld, as well as the mountains, the streams, and the woods, to be ruled by beings like their own chiefs, but infinitely more powerful. Every passion as war and love, and every art as poetry and smithcraft, had its divine founder, Ongawa, a teacher and exponent. And all of these deities and their imagined children, they wove the poetic, sorry, 
And of all these deities and their imagined children, they wove the poetical and allegorical romances which form the subject of the present volume. Gordon is going to the airport. Enjoy the, uh, I don't know if you're just going plane spotting or you're actually going abroad. Uh, Gordon, enjoy the trip. Uh, safe travels. Hope to see you soon. Yep. Becca says it well. It's fascinating to think we all came from the same place way back. Like other nations too, whether Aryan or non-Aryan, the Celts had, besides their mythology, a religion. It is not enough to tell the tales of shadowy gods. They must be made visible by sculpture, housed in groves or temples, served with ritual and propitiated with sacrifices if one is to hope for their favours. Every cult must have its priests living by the altar. The priests of the Celts are well known to us by the name as the by name as the Druids, a word derived from a root dor, which signifies a tree and especially the oak in several Aryan languages. This is generally, though not by all scholars, taken as proving that they paid an especial veneration to the king of trees. It is true that the mistletoe, that strange parasite upon the oak, was prominent among their herbs of power and played a part in their ritual. But this is equally true of other Aryan nations. By the Norse, it was held sacred to the god Baldr, while the Romans believed it to be the, quote, golden bough, unquote, that gave access to Hades. The accounts both of the Latin and Greek, sorry, the Latin and Gaelic writers gave, give us a fairly complete idea of the nature of the Druids and especially of the high estimation in which they were held. They were at once the priests, the physicians, the wizards, the diviners, the theologians, the scientists and the historians of their tribes. All spiritual power and all human knowledge were vested in them. and they ranked second only to the kings and chiefs. They were freed from all contribution to the state, whether by tribute or service in war, so that they might the better apply themselves to their divine offices. Their decisions were absolutely final, and those who disobeyed them were laid under a terrible excommunication or boycott. <clears throat> Classic writers, Tell us how they lorded it in Gaul, where, no doubt, they borrowed splendour by imitating their more civilised neighbours. Men of the highest rank were proud to cast aside the insignia of mere mortal honour to join the company of those who claimed to be the direct mediators of the sky god and the thunder god, and who must have resembled the, the ecclesiastics of medieval Europe in the days of their greatest power, combining, like them, spiritual and temporal dignities and possessing the highest culture of their age. Yet it was not among these druids of Gaul with their splendid temples and vestments and their elaborate rituals that the metropolis of druidism was to be sought. We learn from Caesar that the Gallic or Gallic, 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 G-A-L-L-I-C, Gallic, Gallic, Druids believed their religion to have come from them originally, from Britain, sorry, have come to them originally from Britain, and that it was their practice to send their, quote, theological students, unquote, across the channel to learn its doctrines at their purest source. To trace a cult backwards is often to take a retrograde, retrograde course in culture, and it was no doubt in Britain, which Pliny the Elder tells us, quote, might have taught magic to Persia, unquote, that the sufficiently primitive and savage rites of the Druids of Gaul were preserved in their still more savage and primitive forms. It is, cu it is curious corroboration of this alleged British origin of Druidism that the ancient Irish also believed their Druidism to have come from the sister island. Sheila Gunn is heading to an island off Mexico on Friday for a week. Sounds fabulous. Is that near Te... Uh, say what? How do you pronounce it? Say what? Taneo. Never mind. That's it. Yes. 
Shut up, Anthony. It, it is curious cooperation. There's a legend of Mr. Rogers. <laughs> that the ancient Irish also believe their druidism to have come from the sister island. The heroes, their heroes and seers are describing, are described as only gaining the highest knowledge by traveling to Alba. However this may be, we may take it as certain that this druidism was the accepted religion of the Celtic race. Yeah, Alba didn't always mean uh, Britain as a whole, it's sometimes referred to Scotland. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, Michael Trot, uh, the nip of autumn is in the morning air in the southern hemisphere. Hello to all, a happy, very happy autumn equinox to you, uh, Michael. We've been busy uh, earlier on greeting everybody with a happy spring equinox uh, to all the uh, northern hemispherers. Uh, but I uh, hope you're in good form. Thank you for joining us, and a very good Tuesday morning to you from all of us here who are still in Monday. Uh, hope you're having a great uh, uh, equinox. Did I read that sentence? However this may be, we may take it as certain that this Druidism was ex the accepted religion of the Celtic race. Certain scholars look deeper for its origin, holding its dark superstitions and savage rites to bear the stamp of lower minds than those of the poetic and manly Celts. Professor Rees inclines to see three forms of religion in the British islands at the time of the Roman invasion. The, quote, Druidism, unquote, of the Iberian Aborigines. The pure polytheism of the Britons, who, having come later into the country, had mixed but little with the natives. And the mingled Aryan and non-Aryan cults of the Gaels, who were already largely amalgamated with them. But many authorities dissent from this view, and indeed we are not obliged to postulate borrowing from tribes in a lower state of culture to explain primitive and savage features underlying a higher religion. The Aryan notion, nations must have passed equally with all others through a state of pure savagery, and we know that the religion of the Greeks in many respects so lofty sheltered features and legends as barbarous as any that can be attributed to the Celts. Of the famous teaching of the Druids, we know little, owing to their habit of never allowing their doctrines to be put into writing. And that's very important. Uh, the Druids never allowed anything to be written down. The word was sacred. Caesar, however, record, roughly records its scope. As one of their leading dogmas, he says, they inculcate this, that souls are not annihilated, but pass after death from one body to another. And they hold that by this teaching, men are much encouraged to valor uh, through disregarding the fear of death. They also discuss and impart to the young many things concerning the heavenly bodies and their movements, the size of the world uh, and our earth, natural science and of the influence and power of the immortal gods. The Romans seem to have held their wisdom in some awe, though it is not unlikely that the Druids themselves borrowed whatever knowledge they may have had of science and philosophy from the classical culture. Yeah, I'm tired of that old uh, notion. That their creed of transmigration was not, however, merely taken over from the Greeks seems certain from its appearance in the ancient Gaelic myths. Not only the shape shifting common to the magic stories of all nations, but actual reincarnation was in the power of privileged beings. The hero Cuchulain was urged by the men of Ulster to marry because they knew, quote, that his rebirth would be of himself, unquote, and they did not wish so great a warrior to be lost to their tribe. Another legend tells how the famous Finn McCool was reborn after 200 years as an Ulster king called Mungon, or Mongan. Such ideas, however, belonged to the metaphysical side of Druidism. Far more important to the practical primitive mind are ritual and sacrifice, by the due performance of which the gods are persuaded or compelled to grant Earth's increase and length of days to men. Among the Druids, this honoring, sorry, this humoring of the divinities 
took the shape of human sacrifice and that upon a scale which would seem to have been unsurpassed in horror even by the most savage tribes of West Africa or Polynesia. The whole Gaulish nation, Caesar says, is to a great degree devoted to superstitious rites. And on this account, those who are afflicted with severe diseases or who are engaged in battles and dangers either sacrifice human beings for victims or vow that they will immolate themselves. And these employ the Druids as ministers for such sacrifices because they think that unless the life of man be repaid for the life of man, the will of the immortal gods cannot be appeased. They also ordain national offerings of the same kind. Others make wickerwork images of vast size, the limbs of which they fill with living men and set on fire. Nasty stuff. We find evidence of similarly awful customs in pagan Ireland. Among the oldest Gaelic records are tracts called Dinchanicus, in which famous places are enumerated together with the legends relating to them. Excuse me. Such topographies are found in several of the great Irish medieval manuscripts and therefore, of course, received their final transcription at the hands of monks. And the next part is very important. But these ecclesiastics rarely tampered with compositions in elaborate verse. Nor can it be imagined that any monastic scribe could have invented such a legend as this one, which describes the practice of human sacrifice among the ancient Irish. The poem, which is found in the books of Leinster, of Ballymoat, of Lecan, and in a document called the Wren's, the Wren Manuscript, which are the um, prose Dinchanicus, uh, and uh, transcribed or uh, translated by Whitley Stokes in Rivu Celtic, <coughs> records the reason why a spot near the present village of Ballymagoran in County Cavan receives the name of My Schlecht, the Plain of Adoration. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one more swig of the old water. It's really vodka, but don't tell anyone. Rosanna Marsh is saying a very good evening from an autumnal evening in Cape Town in South Africa. Rosanna, it's very great. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, greetings of the autumn, autumnal equinox to you. For us, it's spring equinox. Hope you're in good form and uh, glad that you are able to join us from all the way down in South Africa uh, this evening. He used to be, this is the, the it looks like it's the entire Din Shanika's poem. He here used to be a high idol with many fights, which was named the Crum Crook. It made every tribe to be without peace. It was a sad evil. Brave Gales used to worship it. From it, they would not without, from it, they would not without tribute ask to be satisfied as to their portion of the hard world. He was their god, the withered crumb with many mists. The people whom he shook over every host, the everlasting kingdom they shall not have. <laughs> yes, there indeed is the Christian incursion into the rhyme. To him without glory, they would kill their piteous, wretched offspring with much wailing and peril to pour their blood around crumb crook. Milk and corn they would ask from him speedily in return for one third of their healthy issue. Great was the honour and the scare of him. To him, noble gales would prostrate themselves. From the worship of him with many manslaughters, the plain is called my Schlecht. They did evil. They beat their palms. They pounded their bodies. Wailing to the demon who enslaved them, they shed falling showers of tears. Around Crum Crook, there the hosts would prostrate themselves, though he put them under deadly disgrace. Their name clings to the noble plain. In their ranks stood four times three stone idols, twelve in other words, to bitterly beguile the hosts. The figure of the crumb was made of gold. Since the rule of Herimon, as in the first of the Milesian high kings, the noble man of grace, there was worshipping of stones until the coming of good Patrick of Macha. A sledgehammer to the crumb he applied from crown to soul. He destroyed without lack of vigor, sorry, without lack of valor, the feeble idol which was there. That I mentioned that I think much earlier on 
uh, about how Patrick was supposed to have destroyed the idol of Crom Croak with a sledgehammer. I really don't know, Mavanwe, whether there is or not, is the honest truth. I don't know. The Killy Cluggan stone in Cavan is supposedly the stone which contained the spirit of Crom Croak before it was cast out by St. Patrick. There are um, stones, there's one at Grange Stone Circle at Loch Gur, and is there one where else? Is it Castle Ruddy? Ken Williams was writing about this lately. Um, called is it Crom Dove or Rannoch Crom Dove? Uh, which may, may or may not be related to this crumb crook. I personally take the things Julius Caesar says about the Celts with a grain of salt. He did essentially commit genocide on his campaigns. The Celts may have done human sacrifice, but Caesar had issues. Yeah, I know history being written by the victor and all that history being a form of propaganda, mythology being a purer form of history. Such we gather from a tradition which we may deem authentic was human sacrifice in early Ireland. According to the quoted verse, one third of the healthy children was slaughtered, presumably every year, to wrest from the powers of nature the grain and grass upon which the tribes and their cattle subsisted. That hardly, I, I mean, a beggar's belief, but who knows, you know? Yeah, that's the one, Peter. Yes, indeed. In the prose in Shanachus, preserved in the Rhen manuscript, there is a slight variant. T is there at my schlecht. It runs. Sorry. Tis there. Sorry. Tis there at my schlecht. It runs. Was the king idol of Aaron, namely the Crom Croic. And around him were 12 idols made, made of stone, but he was of gold. Until Patrick's advent, he was the god of every folk that colonized Ireland. To him, they used to offer the firstlings of every issue and the chief scions of every clan. The same authority also tells us that these sacrifices were made at Halloween, which took the place in the Christian calendar of the heathen Samhain, summer's end, when the sun's power waned and the strength of the gods of darkness, winter and the underworld grew great. Who then was this bloodthirsty deity? His name Crom Croic means the bowed one of the mound and was evidently applied to him only after his fall from Godhead. It relates to the tradition that, at the approach of the all-conquering St. Patrick, the demon fled from his golden image, which thereupon sank forward in the earth, in homage to the power that had come to supersede it. But from another source, we glean that the word crum was a kind of pun upon ken, C-E-N-N, -E -N, and that the real title was the king idol of Aaron, Sorry, the real title of the King Idol of Ireland was Ken Croak, the head or lord of the mound. Professor Rees, in his Celtic heathendom, suggests that he was probably the Gaelic heaven god, worshipped like the Hellenic Zeus upon high places, natural or artificial. At any rate, we may see in him the god most revered by the Gaels, surrounded by the other 12 members of their pantheon. It would appear probable that the Celtic state worship was what is called solar. All its chief festivals related to points in the sun's progress, the equinoxes having been considered more important than the solstices. Wow, today is equinox. There you go. It was at the spring equinox called by the Celts Bialtana, and that's a mistake. Uh, spring equinox and Bialtana are not the same thing. In every 19th year that we learn from Diodorus the Sicilian, a writer contemporary Julius Caesar, Apollo himself appeared to the worships and was worshippers and was seen harping and dancing in the sky until the rising of the Ple Pleiades. But that's interesting because 19 years is the Metonic cycle. So that's the, 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 the beginning or end or the, the, the re recurrence or whatever you want to call it of the cycle. The other corresponding festival was Samhain. The autumn equinox, again, he's mistaken there completely. Autumn equinox and Samhain are separated by uh, three months. Six weeks, sorry. Yeah. Uh, as are uh, Bialtana and the spring equinox, six weeks, a little bit over. As Bialtana marked the beginning of summer, so Samhain recorded its end. 
The summer solstice was also a great Celtic feast. It was held at the beginning of August to honour the god Lugus by the Gauls. The Gaul, Gaul called Lugus by the Gauls, Lu by the Gaels, and Clu by the Britons, the pan-Celtic Apollo. And probably when the cult of the war god had fallen from its early prominence, the chief figure of the common pantheon. And again, he's wrong. He's talking about the summer solstice being celebrated in the beginning of August, which is Lunasa. Anyway, pinch of salt, folks. This is where we have to be careful about the sources. It was, a, it was doubtless at Stonehenge that the British Apollo was thus seen harping and dancing. That marvellous structure well corresponds to Diodorus's description of a, quote, magnificent temple of Apollo, unquote, which he locates in the centre of Britain. It is a circular enclosure, he says, adorned with votive offerings and tablets with Greek inscriptions suspended by travellers upon the walls. The rulers of the temple and city are called uh, Boridae, and they take up the government from each other according to the order of their tribes. Just uh, two more pages and we'll be done. The citizens are given up to music, harping and chanting in honour of the sun. Stonehenge, therefore, was a sacred religious centre, equally revered by and equally belonging to all the British tribes, uh, a Rome or Jerusalem of our ancient paganism. The same great gods were, no doubt, ador adored by all the Celts, not only of Great Britain and Ireland, but of continental Gaul as well. Sometimes they can be traced by name right across the ancient Celtic world. In other cases, what is obviously the same personified power of nature is found in various places with the same attributes, but with a different title. Besides these, there must have been a multitude of lesser gods worshipped by certain tribes alone, to whom they stood as ancestors and guardians. I swear by the gods of my people was what the ordinary oath of a hero in the ancient Gaelic sagas. The Aboriginal tribes must also have had their gods, whether it be true or not that their religion influenced the Celtic Druidism. Professor Rees inclines to see in the Genii Locorum the almost nameless spirits of well and river, mountain and wood, shadowy remnants of whose cults survive today, members of a swarming pantheon of the older Iberians. These local beings would in no way conflict with the great Celtic nature gods, and the two worships could exist side by side, both even claiming the same votary. It needs the stern faith of monotheism to deny the existence of the gods of others. Polytheistic nations have seldom or never risen to such a height. In their dealings with a conquered people, the conquerors naturally held their own gods to be the stronger. Still, it could not be denied that the gods of the conquered were upon their own ground. They knew, so to speak, the country and might have unguessed powers of doing evil. What if, to avenge their worshippers worshippers and themselves, they were to make the land barren and useless to the conquerors? Actually, I'm not sure if he's going to say that, but actually that's something that the, the, the Daedamans did to the Milesians. Uh, they cast a spell on the land to make it barren, and uh, the Milesians had to, to, to go and beg the Daedamans to, to quit the mess and, <laughs> and to please uh, return the landscape to normal. So that conquering pagan nations have usually been quite ready to stretch out the hand of welcome to the deities of their new subjects. Going to take a quick note of that, actually. Forgive me. So that conquering pagan nations have usually been quite ready to stretch out the hand of welcome to the deities of their new subjects to propitiate themselves by sacrifice and even to admit them within the pale of their own pantheon. This raises the question of the exact nationality of the gods whose stories we are about to tell. Were they all Aryan, or did any of the greater Aboriginal deities climb up to take their place among the Gaelic tribe of the goddess Danu, or the British children of the goddess Don? Some of the Celtic gods have seemed to scholars to bear signs of a non-Aryan origin. The point, however, is at present very obscure. Neither does it much concern us. 
just as the diverse deities of the Greeks, some Aryan and Hellenic, some pre-Aryan and uh, Pelasgian, some imported and Semitic, were all gathered into one great divine family. So, so we may consider as members of one national Olympus all these gods whose legends make up the mythology of the British Islands. And thus ends that chapter. And next week we will begin the new section, which is the Gaelic gods and their stories. Uh, and this is, begins where the book really gets really good from the point of view of Irish mythology, uh, where it begins to talk about the gods of the Gaels, which is the name of the next chapter. I hope you all had a uh, wonderful evening, as I certainly did in your wonderful company. And uh, onwards and upwards, as they say, uh, spring equinox and um, uh, the year um, uh, turning uh, very quickly. Isn't time flying? Although I'm looking forward to the brighter, longer days. Definitely, because this winter has seemed to drag out a bit. Uh, excuse me, please do not forget to subscribe to YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, don't forget to go to the Mythical Ireland Facebook pages and the Mythical Ireland community, etc. And if you're on Instagram and Twitter, you can follow us on there. And don't forget on the website, mythicalireland.com. I'm all the time adding, as well as there's new blog posts regularly. Uh, don't forget to visit our shop. Uh, some new items in the merchandise store have been added um the so uh, there was a lot of commentary i'm just going to share a link there a lot of commentary about the triple conjunction there uh a couple of weeks ago showing venus and jupiter and the moon over newgrange it's a couple of different variants of that available as uh, metal prints canvas prints framed canvas prints etc and regular photographic prints do uh, take time to check it out if you want and to those who are not already patrons, if you would like to become a patron of Mythical Ireland, you will find that lots of uh, interesting stuff is being shared for patrons at the moment. For instance, page by page, my new book, which is currently in progress, I'm sharing uh, the draft uh, script of that page by page with patrons at the Bronze Age level and above. Uh, and uh, in recent days, a, an update video, a 30, I think it's 38 minute update video. Um, so lots of stuff to enjoy on there that you may not see elsewhere if you have the time and uh, not for much in the way of cost, uh, but your patronage certainly helps uh, to keep Mythical Ireland going and to keep us doing the things that we are doing, we being me. Goodbye and enjoy your vernal equinox, says Karen, and coming lushness of spring. Yes, indeed. Hopefully it will be a lush one. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe, and uh, a very good uh, evening to you and uh to um whoever was it uh, kathy may who's who's got covid uh i hope um that uh, kathy you get well soon and all our very best wishes to you from every rex fortenbury is saying take care yeah all that remains at this point for me at this point of the evening is to say as i always do ikawa kolosov slongafol and togabuggy Take it easy. We will see you next week. In the meantime, there are things to be celebrated. <laughs>